And joining me now is the Democratic Senator from Virginia, Tim Kaine. Thanks for coming. Chuck, it's good to be back. All right, I want to talk about all things having to do with Brexit here a minute. I yeah. want to get you to, uh, to respond to Donald Trump's reaction to it. People want to take their country back. Uh, they want to have independence in a sense. And uh, you see it with Europe, all over Europe. You're going to have more than just, in my opinion, more than just what happened uh, last night. You're going to have, I think, many other cases where they want to take their borders back. They want to take their, uh, their monetary back. They want to take a lot of things back. They want to be able to have a country again. So I think you're going to have this happen uh, more and more. I really believe that. And I think it's happening in the United States. It's happening by the fact that I've done so well in the polls. Do you think he's right that there's a parallel? Well, well Trump finishes with the real punchline, why I've done so well. It, it's always got to be about him. And you saw the other thing he said was he said, hey, the British pound has taken a beating now. That could help my hotel out. Your loss, Britain, is my gain. This is a guy who will always put himself first. So, of course, he's going to interpret it about here's why I've done well. Okay, but what's your take? M my take is what this. Is this um, there's a couple of things you got to understand. Young voters, those under 50, and especially millennials, overwhelmingly voted to stay. Mm -hmm. um, and it was older voters who voted to leave. And certainly, immigration issues are important and a concern about some of the European regulation, et cetera. It's, it's a huge deal. It really is. And, it's, and the important thing for us is because the relationship with Britain has been so strong, and we're, we're so close to European nations, we have to help them find a path over the next couple of years to do this in a way that can keep uh, keep ties rather than uh, tear ties apart. But I want to explore this parallel here a minute. You had an urban-rural split in the UK mm -hmm. on this vote, where urban uh, it, uh, urban folks voted to stay in the EU. It was in smaller towns that they mm -hmm. didn't. We have a similar urban-rural split when it comes to trust in institutions, with economic inequality, with what's on the issue of trade, for instance. Yeah. So. These parallels are deep. There, there are parallels. And, and look, the parallels are parallels of division. You know, it, it is, uh, we, we ought to not be using hostile rhetoric when we talk about each other. I remember Lincoln in his first inaugural address said, we are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Mm -hmm. Though passion may have strained, surely it cannot break the bonds of our affection. We often hear in the political class the really hot, angry rhetoric. I think it's a time for solid political leaders who can be calming and who can try to remind people that, hey, Didn't in David America, Cameron we're not enemies. Both David, David Cameron and President Obama together tried that tact and it didn't work. Well, Why look, didn't I, I, it work? I, I, I don't, President Obama is not, you know, from the UK, so they mm -hmm. needed to hear from their leaders. And I think the decision to go ahead, hey, let's have the referendum, it, it unleashed this torrent of, of negativity. And, and, and are, are there reasons for people to be upset and angry? Sure, at Washington, at the economy, there's all kinds of challenges we have. But leaders got to speak to the best in people, and, and especially in our country. Let's talk about it here. We got to have people right. who know how to bring us together. And you know, I'm a strong supporter of Secretary Clinton, and that's one of the many reasons that I'm a supporter of her. You know, like the economic anxiety here, uh, xenophobia, immigration has been used to sort of. Uh, uh, essentially explain why they should be upset. Well, this was a billboard in the UK on behalf of the Leave folks, and it was all, it was pictures of Syrian migrants mm -hmm. flooding into Europe. Of course, none of these folks were flooding into the into UK. Britain. Right. Um, is there a pretty straight line between the president's indecision on Syria, or, or the world's decision not to essentially try to do something more in Syria at that time, leading to the Syrian migrant crisis, which now is leading to the crack-up of Europe? Well, I don't know that there's a straight line. I think it's a factor. I think there's a lot of factors. Um, some, of the, some of the challenges in the Eurozone and the question of which countries needed to be participating to help other countries, England not in the Eurozone, but they were very much close to that. So there's a lot of issues that we, we got to pay attention to. But again, You've I been got, critical of the president and on, on Syria, look, on am, specifically on Syria. Yeah, are you still a critic? I'm a strong supporter of the president across the board, but there are some things where we disagree. I don't think we should be at war without a vote of Congress. And in beginning in February of 2014, I started to call for the notion that we should do a humanitarian safe zone in northern Syria where Syrian refugees who don't want to leave their country uh, could go there. And that's something that I, I think it, had we done that, I think that uh, uh, you wouldn't have seen the outflow of refugees we've seen. The president did do something really good in Syria, which was lead to the destruction of one of the largest chemical weapons stockpiles in the world, and that's an important thing. But this refugee crisis is significant. Yeah, it's interesting. You, you seem to criticize the president on this, saying that because he lacks an ideological sort of organizing principle when it comes to foreign policy, mm -hmm. that it, it's made him less reactive. Um, you know, it, it, yes, he wants to not be as reactive, but 
it's actually frozen him a little well, bit. He, he, what do you mean, explain first, that? Well, yeah, first, but I'm a strong supporter of the president's foreign policy for the, for the main reason he's reinvigorated diplomacy in this country. We we were not we didn't have a diplomatic muscle in the previous administration, and this president has brought America back in diplomacy, which is where we need to be strong. Uh, but you know, the president once said famously, "I don't want to do stupid stuff," and and sometimes not doing stupid stuff leads you to not do stuff it's stupid not to do. And I think in, in, in Syria, you know, again, the destruction of the chemical weapons stockpile was a big deal, but I think we could have done more to avert the flow of refugees. And this is not just the United States. I think many nations could have been part of that. Okay, what do we do now? Because well, if you don't stem the, uh, this is still, more European countries may just decide yep. Um, me first. Uh, make sure that the, the control of this nation is in the hands of somebody who's steady and confident and calm. I mean, um, we, we are making an existential choice in this nation, just like Brexit would be seen in Britain as an existential choice. This election for president is, is existential. Does torture come back or not? Um, do, we, uh, do we change our fundamental values and punish people based on their religion? Or do we keep up with the Virginia value of tolerating and welcoming all religions? Mm -hmm. And so we've got to have a commander in chief who knows what she's doing. And uh, that's the most important issue that's on the table for us right now. Just like Europe or England is gonna grapple with this important question of Brexit, we have to grapple with uh, the, the style of leadership we want going forward. Is the single greatest challenge for the next president in the Middle East, Syria? For, oh, I don't think that's the single greatest challenge. I, no. think, we, I think we've got a lot of challenges. I, I would say the, the rise of non-state power. So mm -hmm. whether you're talking ISIL or Al-Qaeda, yeah. the Sinaloa cartel, you know, corporations that hide everything offshore and try to evade accountability. This is the 21st century reality, Chuck. A lot of our doctrines are about state v. state. Now you have this non-state powers, and I don't yet think we've really grappled with how to incorporate them into our national security thinking. All right, I want to shift to guns. This was a big topic, yep. obviously, in, the, in both chambers of Congress uh, this week. You've said this uh, on the Heller decision. Mm -hmm. You've said that you strongly believe that there is an individual yep. right, and you completely accept the Heller decision that, that says the right is individual, which means you cannot essentially prevent many individuals from whatever it is, concealing carry um, and, and buying certain weapons. But So what room is there to regulate? Do you oh, believe the person ab, that ab, you can regulate the individual question. or that you regulate the firearm? Yeah, great, great question. So um, there is an individual right. But the right says well-regulated in the, in the Second Amendment is the phrase well-regulated. Let's, let's talk about the First Amendment for a second. Freedom of speech. We believe it. You're a journalist. Mm -hmm. But you can't libel or slander somebody with no consequence. I can't take classified information I get as a senator and give it to somebody with no consequence. Freedom of speech has reasonable limits. Freedom of assembly. We can protest, but you can't march onto the floor okay. of the Senate and do crazy stuff. No, there's going to be rules and regulations. And the Second Amendment is exactly the same. It says well regulated in the amendment. And the Heller case said, sure, it's an individual right, but there's reasonable regulation. And the court has upheld, the courts, you know, for so, many years have upheld all. So what kinds levels of, of regulation? Hillary Clinton, for instance, wants to increase the number of gun sales that are subject to background checks. Yes. Uh, whether it's um, closing what she called the Charleston mm -hmm. loophole. So if a background this check is isn't completed, so do you support Chuck, all of these Chuck, clear, principles? Background checks clearly constitutional. I'll tell okay. you why. The federal law right now prohibits nine categories of individuals from having weapons. That's been subject to constitutional challenges and it's fine. The only way to enforce that law, we're, we're battling this week to try to add a 10th category, no guns in the hands of terrorists. The only way to enforce that law is to have a background record check system. And if you don't have the system, then the prohibited people get weapons. This was the tragedy of the shooting at Virginia Tech when I was governor. Somebody who was barred from having a weapon got it because of weaknesses in the system. So background record checks clearly constitutional. Are you in favor of an assault weapons ban? Here, I have voted for it. Um, but I think there's a better way to go at the problem, and that is limitations on the size of magazines and ammunition clips. Here's the challenge. Do so you think an AR-15 should be sold? It, here's the thing. You don't I, think there I, should be a limitation I, on how I, to sell? I have voted for it, and I would likely vote for it again, but here's a practical problem that I think you're aware of. As soon as you define what an assault weapon is, you know, you can't sell a weapon, and here's how we describe it. Gun manufacturers just make a, one adjustment or two, and they say, see, this isn't subject to the limitation. Whereas if you say... You can't sell an ammunition clip or a magazine that would have more than 10 or 12 rounds. That is you a very ammunition is the way to go. I, I really think that's probably the way to, to tackle the problem more effectively. Are you uh, qualified to be commander in chief? 
you know what, it, nobody should ever say they're ready for that responsibility because it is so, uh, so huge. What does that I, mean I'm, when you hear that question? What do you think that means? What should go I into being I mean, qualified? You know, Abraham Lincoln wouldn't have said yes to that question. Harry Truman wouldn't have said yes to that question. Those are my two favorite presidents. I am doing my best to be a good senator. I came in saying that, you know, you know I replaced Jim Webb. And I always yeah. said, like, I can't replace Jim Webb because I'm not sure that's possible. I'm going to try to be a good successor. Uh -huh. And taking on the armed services and foreign relations responsibilities, I'm trying to be a good successor. You're somebody that speaks out, and you're not afraid to criticize this president. You uh, have criticized him when it comes to you know, declaring war, that mm -hmm. what he's done with ISIL Although should I, be codified I by Congress. Congress more. That, but absolutely. Him, but him too. Are you going to be comfortable, would you be comfortable having to sell somebody else's position if they don't agree with you on, for instance, the definition of war powers? You know, l like a lot of people, I have been a leader in some things and I've been a follower in some things. So uh, I was a lieutenant governor to mm -hmm. Mark Warner. I was a Democratic National Committee chair to President Obama. So when I've been mayor, governor, senator, I've been the main guy, but you know whether it's in my you know in my church with the parish council or uh, in other uh, areas, um, I I know how to be I know how to work on a team. And most of life, mm -hmm. frankly, to get things done, you have to get done. You got to work as a team. When you go through this process, you went through it eight years ago. I know you don't want to talk about what you're going through now. But is it a two-way interview? It, is it a two-way process? There, don't you have questions? Don't, yeah, don't use the word process. There's people will speculate, but I got one job and one job only mm -hmm. right now, and that is to to work hard for Hillary Clinton so she can win, and especially in Virginia. That, that's, that's the area where I've been helping her, and that's right, the area where I'm going to help her. All right, let me ask you this. If she asks her. you to help her in some form or another, whatever the position is, what's your question to her before you accept? Oh, look, I, I, the reason I'm helping Hillary, I, I, I encouraged her to run in May of 2014 mm -hmm. because I could telescope forward and see some of the challenges that this nation would be facing. And I decided that by reason of character, by reason of background, uh, and experience, but also especially by reason of results, she would be the most qualified person to be president in January of 2017. And so I've I've answered the questions that I need answered, and that's why really, I'm there's no other so hard for her. assurance you would need before you would I, accept I, doing anything. I have her. done my homework. Mm -hmm. I have done my homework. You vetted what her. The, I have done my homework about what I think this country needs right now, and uh, you know everybody. We got a nation of 300 plus million people, mm -hmm. and I am absolutely confident she is the right person to tackle the huge challenges that are ahead of us. You know, when you first ran as lieutenant governor, you were classified as a pro-life Democrat. You're now not considered a pro-life Democrat. How would you describe your abortion position? Um, you know, the I, I would say people use labels all the time, but I, I'm kind of a look traditional Catholic. I don't like uh, personally. I'm opposed to abortion, and personally, I'm opposed to the death penalty. Um, are there regulations that should be on abortion? Um, but, on, but, 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 but let me, let me uh, continue. I deeply believe, and not just as a matter of politics, but even as a matter of morality, that matters about reproduction and intimacy and relationships and contraception uh, are in the personal realm. They're, they're moral decisions for individuals to make for themselves. And the last thing we need mm -hmm. is government intruding into those personal decisions. So I've taken the position, which is quite common among Catholics, I got a personal feeling about abortion, but the right rule for government is to let women make their own decisions. So for example, we, you know, Monday, the Supreme Court's likely to decide a really important case mm -hmm. about abortion rights, which is many states, including Virginia, right. have tried to basically take out the constitutional right that gives women the ability to choose by putting these onerous regulations on clinics, health clinics where abortions are provided. We fought those off in Virginia when I was governor because you've got to let people make their own moral choices when it comes to matters of reproduction, intimacy, and relationships. All right, a lot of people are writing about you right now uh, in, in American politics. And there is, seems to be a Don't theme. believe the hype. Well, Don't believe the hype. All right, Kane is as boring as he is safe. Um, Kane is also considered kind of well boring after they talk about it. He has a deep resume, well tested political skills, but he's not anybody's idea of exploding volcano of charisma. <laughs> that, that might be my favorite description here, an exploding, you lack an exploding volcano of charisma. Is, are these um, critiques or compliments to you? I, I, I mean, they're, they're true, I am boring. But, okay. you know, but, 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 you know, boring is the fastest growing demographic in this country. Yeah, so there you go. Well, Tim Kaine, you have a sense of humor as well. <laughs> Thanks, Chuck. Thanks for coming. Yeah, Appreciate it. Good to be with you. You got it. Hey, NBC News fans. Thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and then click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. 
Thanks for watching.